Good morning, everybody. You are joining us now for uh, TP Solutions Wireless Technology and Mobile Devices, How to Use Them Securely and Responsibly. Uh, the webinar will begin in about one more minute. I'm just going to let some people give them some time to log in. Technology and mobile devices securely and responsibly webinar. Uh, my name is Jill Rose. I'm your moderator and webinar organizer. As always, I just have a few housekeeping tips just before we get started. Everyone has been placed on mute just to cut down on any background noise. So if you do have any questions during the presentation, you can use the question box to type them out and we'll answer them uh, periodically during the webinar. We'll also take a break at the end for Q&A. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available for download on our website a little bit later this afternoon. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's presenter, Mr. Ben Schmerler. He is DP Solutions Senior IT Risk Advisor. Ben, take it away. Thank you very much, Jill, and uh, thanks everybody for attending this morning. I, I hope you find this informative. Um, we're going to just talk uh, about this wireless and mobile device concerns um, and we'll touch on things like cloud, and policy implications and different ideas for security and management. And this is a pretty broad item because uh, it touches on a lot of things and really rep uh, represents a shift in some of the ways we think uh, about securing uh, uh, systems from what used to be a very uh, inside out approach where we're really focused on a bunch of devices sitting in a, a central location to more of a broad approach where we're concerned uh, about how everything connects with one another all over often the planet. So uh, we'll uh, we'll get started, and uh, as we go along, I think uh, we'll we'll have more detail. So uh, here's the agenda today. Some of the topics we're going to be talking about. So uh, first, we have uh, you know types of mobile devices and wireless connectivity solutions. Um, as you know, we're definitely entering a new world of connectivity and options and devices we can use for this. Uh, where data sits, uh, data governance and management essentially, so specifically in the cloud, because um, you know I would say almost every SMB today has some kind of uh, off-site presence, uh, whether it's hosted email or perhaps uh, an application or something like that, and that obviously drives this process. Uh, we're going to talk about ways we connect to systems and uh, potential implications of that, both positive and maybe a little bit more challenging. Uh, we're going to talk about impact on policy, so essentially how uh, the ability to work uh, remotely or in a cloud environment or with any kind of uh, bring your own device stuff, how that might imp uh, uh, impact the rules and procedures your organization takes to manage this stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about a very important um, idea about encryption, uh, encryption at rest versus encryption in transit and why both matter. Um, now that we're really decentralizing our workforce, um, making sure that data is private and unreadable, only uh, and unreadable by the people who, who uh, are entitled to it is really, really important. Uh, mobile device to management, which is really, uh, we're really referring to the service and the tech. And then also uh, network monitoring and endpoint detection. So uh, a little bit more sophisticated security that can be done in certain situations, whether for compliance reasons or management reasons, you know, things we could do above and beyond that improve uh, security for a mobile workforce. So, uh, you know, if you're in a typical organization these days, your employees may use a, a bunch of different kinds of items. So, uh, obviously, uh, you know, I think a lot of this was precipitated with smartphones. Uh, I remember I got my iPhone, I think, in like 2007, and even before then, I had a BlackBerry. And so, these uh, early on, these were minor considerations as those devices were quite limited and we're usually used for like messaging or maybe email. Uh, but now uh, everything can be done on a smartphone. Uh, you know, even the software as a service uh, applications are often have web versions and such. We have uh, devices like tablets. So, you know, uh, when you, if you really want to be simple about it, these are often bigger versions, sometimes more, more powerful, com you know, computing wise, have keyboards, et cetera, but very similar to the smartphones. Uh, again, very decentralized, often personally owned. 
uh, and uh, usually don't necessarily um, uh, are you know aren't necessarily uniform. So you might have an organization with an iPad and an Android tablet and a Kindle Fire or something like that. You know that's something you could easily see. Of course, laptops. You know, just computers that uh, often you know Windows or Macs or or whatever. Uh, netbooks and thin clients. So in in this, I would put things like Google Chromebooks, uh, for example, which are very popular. Uh, you've got devices like uh, you know some of the Wise terminals or Dell terminals that are used to connect to sort of a virtual desktop environment. Uh, very effective and uh, can be very uh, inexpensive, uh, limited features, but can really do a lot and are becoming uh, sort of uh, a viable option in a lot of places that use the cloud. Uh, home PCs, you know, uh, you may have staff that work from their home uh, with either with a company issued uh, PC or maybe their own PC. And so these devices are really unmanaged uh, most of the time where uh, it's whatever the employee decides to put on it. Um, and uh, so we really have to talk about those. You have uh, public devices that people may use. And when I say public devices, I'm referring to the kiosk computer at the hotel lobby. Uh, when someone's on vacation, they decide to check their email or look at, uh, or, or look at the uh, CRM that's out in the cloud or something like that. You know, sometimes you have that ability to connect from just public devices that anybody can walk up to. And then, um, you know, obviously this is more of a catch-all, but the so-called Internet of Things devices, IoT. So um, I, I don't want to limit us too much, but uh, almost any device that has some kind of uh, operating system that can support apps or connect to the web, oftentimes these things can be used to connect to sensitive assets that we care about. And uh, I would just ask one fundamental question, which is, as an organization, do you really know what, what your staff is using and, and where they're using it from? Um, if you haven't already thought about that, uh, I think it would be uh, a real good idea to take an inventory and say, well, these are the devices that we own internally. Uh, these are the things that we purchased uh, either through like an IT company like DP Solutions or we got it from Best Buy or Amazon or whatever. These are the things that we own as an organization. But then here's also uh, what our staff may be using. You know, these are the people who work from home and they use these kinds of devices to connect. I always say, you just it, it you sort of have an inventory both of your items but also the other things that can potentially connect and I just think it's a good idea because if something ever happens it's nice to know uh, what kind of uh, overall device footprint and location footprint you're working from because that's going to dictate what kind of solutions you use. Uh, I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about the cloud and the reason I bring up the cloud is I really think that these sorts of um, uh, off-site solutions really drove the mobile and wireless uh, workforce forward. You know, it only became important for Starbucks to have Wi-Fi when an employee could bring in a net, uh, laptop into a coffee shop and start connecting to things and do their work, or a freelancer could could uh, bring their computer and work anytime, anywhere because they're not connected to some central server in a network closet somewhere. So. What do people really mean when they say cloud? And I, I, the reason I'm defining this is that you could be doing any uh, or all of these things um, as, for your organization. So uh, one term you may hear is software as a service, SaaS. I mean, that's really um, when you're getting a service, oftentimes through a web browser uh, that someone else is providing and you're paying a subscription for. Uh, Office 365 is one example. They have a web version that you can use. You could also look at, say, QuickBooks Online as a SaaS type solution. Uh, very common products, and we have to consider what kind of work we're doing in them since we're essentially communicating from a device we control here to some sort of data center in a un really an unknown location uh, that may have sensitive assets in it. We've got servers hosted a private center, which I would call the private cloud. So, for example, uh, you're working with a company and you still want to have basically the exact same servers you had in your office in a closet somewhere, except you've essentially cloned them and put them in a private data center, something that you never actually walk into or touch. Um, basically off, uh, off, um, offloading your server uh, work to somewhere else. Um, a lot of IT companies do this uh, uh, and it's uh, a viable option depending on what kind of solution you're looking for. Uh, then you can have uh, what I call the you know, server spun up an enterprise data center, so like an infrastructure as a service. And I would, I mean, it's sort of similar to private cloud, but I would 
categorize places like Amazon um, or Microsoft Azure as good examples of this. So you just say, I want a server with this much RAM and it's going to do this and they spin it up for you. And um, it's still private, but it's usually distributed a little bit more. You're using a, a enterprise class data center as opposed to some private data center. Uh, you could even say uh, backup and singing solutions. You know, iCloud or Google Drive are cloud solutions, right? So uh, on my cell phone, for example, when I take, you know, I have a, a Samsung Galaxy S9, it's just an Android cell phone, and I have a service that allows the photos that I take on my Android phone to stay on the device, but they also sync up with Google Drive and the Google Cloud. So when I replace my old phone, which is a Samsung Galaxy S7 Edge, it, I installed my new phone, I authenticated with my Google account, and all of a sudden all my stuff was there. I didn't have to reinvent the wheel to get my stuff back, but that's really a, a function of the cloud. You also have uh, what are called hosted desktop environments, you know, uh, virtual desktop infrastructure, VDI is another way of looking at it. Essentially when all of the work, all of the processing is done in a remote session, like a terminal server or a Citrix type thing, where you connect and you log in and then all of the work is and processing is actually being done in the cloud. So instead of you typing a word in Microsoft Word that sits on your desktop, you're connecting to some server that has Microsoft Word on it and then you're typing your letter in there. Uh, and that's obviously a very basic example, but uh, a very popular item and there's a, there are a lot of good reasons to use that. Um, uh, and then you've got hybrid solutions, which is really where most people fit in. Um, you know, uh, uh, today uh, in, in, S, in the SMB space where we do a lot of work, um, these uh, solutions often bump into each other or collide with each other. You have an application that really is best suited for a server in the office, but then three other applications that are like in, maybe perhaps in a SaaS, or you may have a server in a private data center because that server is so important that you can't have the power interruptions that might exist in a regular office. You know, you can combine these things. And the important thing when you're implementing a cloud solution is that you're picking these solutions based on actual function and needs. And of course, we can talk with you about that. Sort of a, a different kind of discussion though. So think of the cloud as a service where the processing and management are not done in your office. Um, you know, as the little, little guy here says. Um, Essentially, you're basically uh, using your devices more as input devices where you send information and receive information as opposed to process and manage information. So there are a lot of implications to this. And first, we'll focus on the, the good areas. You know, the things that uh, all of these mobile and, and wireless things have made uh, better for, for work, working today. So one is the flexibility for where you work. I mean, uh, if you use Office 365, for example, uh, I remember uh, there was a time with old Exchange servers where you needed, even with Outlook uh, running on a laptop, you had to make special considerations just to take that computer to uh, an offsite location from someone's home. Um, obviously, that's matured a little bit, but now uh, with these solutions, they really make it so that you can work anytime, anywhere. And whether it's uh, a Starbucks or an airport or a public library or uh, wherever you want that has a Wi-Fi connection. And that's really a great thing. Um, you're able to get more done when, when you need to. If there's an emergency or you're traveling, uh, you can have uh, you can get access to that information much quicker. I was thinking a little bit myself about this. Uh, when I was in college, I remember I took a trip to Mexico and I had to uh, check in with my professors and I had to go up to a machine and put quarters in just to just to access my email and do this stuff. And I, I think now if I went that back to that same place, uh, it would be like basically a seamless uh, work and I'd be able to do everything I wanted. And things have just changed so much in that regard. Uh, they tend to be device agnostic. So, I mean, really, if you've got an Android or iOS phone or you have a Windows or Mac PC, oftentimes these cloud solutions don't care uh, what kind of computer you're using as long as it's uh, meeting a basic standard in terms of power and uh, processing and whatever app that connects you to this cloud solution uh, is functional. So um, again, think of Office 365. It, you can access that email from any cell phone, any laptop, any desktop computer, anything that you want. Uh, if you set it up right, you can access that uh, information, which is really terrific because everybody's got that office where the one guy 
is just, uh, you know, uh, loves Max. You know, I'm not trying to trash Max or anything like that, but somebody, sometimes you have these, uh, <laughs> these uh, champions of these devices that really love them. Well, great, you know, you can use that device. It suits you, and that's terrific. Uh, hardware is often easier to replace. Um, if none of the processing and data is really sitting on the device and you're just connecting to some sort of service, maybe you have to install a basic application or a log into it or, or create or, or register the device or something like that, but it's much easier to replace hardware in a cloud infrastructure uh, and a wireless infrastructure uh, and mobile infrastructure than it is for a traditional one often uh, where you really have to uh, tie all the knots together uh, furthermore, with a lot of these sorts of wireless uh, data center type solutions, um, uh, you know, anything with the cloud, uh, oftentimes the back end improvements, the operating systems, the security, et cetera, all happens without your knowledge. You're basically outsourcing, uh, outsourcing that kind of function to somebody else. And as anyone who can tell you who's gone from perhaps a migration from Windows Server 2003 to 2008 or an Exchange 2010 to 2016 migration or something like that, you know, that kind of migration from hardware to hardware, from operating system to operating system can be a little tumultuous and, and stressful. Well, that, that goes down quite considerably most, uh, most times. And then, of course, the day-to-day -day management and maintenance of local systems is a little bit easier. You know, if you're not managing a bunch of servers in-house or uh, all of your things are in a mobile environment with, with centralized management from somewhere else, you can oftentimes uh, really cut out a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the difficulty of day-to-day -day management. Uh, and again, essentially, these are the factors that pushed us to use uh, more uh, wireless and mobile technology in the first place. You know, these were the things that drove that process. But there are other things we have to consider. You know, um, when we decided to, you know, when everyone decided to move into more of a wireless, anytime, anywhere, uh, cloud-based uh, type of work, uh, it changed the equation for the things we cared about. And so we'll talk about that now. Now, these are not impossible things to overcome or even necessarily problems. It's just a we just have to ask different questions than what we were asking before. So, for example, so when we're talking about wireless considerations, uh, device management. So consider mobile device management. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that is in a second, but um, if we're having a iPhone that a, a, a uh, a uh, person owns themselves, you know, an individual, they bought it at their AT&T or Verizon store or whatever, and they manage it themselves, but they like don't apply passwords to it or they don't make it so that it gets the important security updates and things like that. And then that same device accesses sensitive information, perhaps downloads sensitive information to that device, maybe for a legitimate business reason, but they're not managing that device properly because it's theirs and they don't want that management. Well, that puts the organization at risk. And so, this is really a case for having a mobile device management system where part of the conditions for connecting to a, a sensitive data asset is to apply certain rules and standards so that if the employee quits or loses their phone or that phone is attacked by a cyber criminal or some kind, we at least have some basic protections to make sure that we're not completely uh, in uh, the wild west with our mobile devices. Obviously, internet connectivity is essential. Uh, people underestimate the fact that uh, you know, in in the old days, when everyone worked in a central office, if you lost your internet connection because a tree branch fell on the line, which is something that does happen all the time, uh, especially with the weather we have here in Maryland recently, um, uh, you definitely need to have a connection to the internet uh, now. But in the past, you didn't, because if you had your file server in the office and you're connecting that file server from your desk, well, who cares if the internet's not there? The file is still there. Now, if that file server exists with uh, Microsoft and their cloud and you lose your internet connection, well, now nobody can connect or somebody has to drive to a different office or something like that or, or, or whatever. So you might consider things like redundant internet connections and load balancers and stuff like that. Uh, encryption in transit is critical. So think again of that path. So everything's in the office and everyone's working in a central location and you're sending a, a document with social security numbers between your computer and the file server, well, everything's internal. The communication is happening over lines in the wall. And assuming that the perimeter is reasonably secure, that information, even if it's not encrypted, uh, should be reasonably con under control because uh, it's, a pr it's a private network. It'd be like the conversations occurring in your home versus over the telephone. 
Um, so uh, the way we work now in terms of these wireless anytime, anyplace workforce uh, is uh, we're now sending sensitive information over the public internet to a cloud host. So it's really important that we encrypt that data. If we're going to use the public internet where that traffic is bumping up against Netflix and Amazon browsing and cybercrime and anything else that's happening over the public web, we need to make sure that our traffic is unreadable to all that other, uh, all those other uh, people on the internet. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, there need to be uh, data storage rules. So we have to consider things like um, what is actually allowed to be stored on the device that we're using uh, in that any time, any place uh, uh, location. So um, if I've got social security numbers that I do work on and I really care about that stuff, uh, I may make rules that say, well, when you're done with this, piece of data, even if you bring it down to your laptop that you're working on at an airport, it's important that you upload it back to the central server and delete it from the hard drive of your local device because we don't want that data to sit on a device that where it could be exposed. Um, there needs to be some data management and uh, discipline behind, behind this stuff. And uh, a good strategy, I would say, is something where you really consider that stuff and we can talk with you about that. Uh, authentication integrity is super important, uh, and I said consider multi-factor authentication here. Um, uh, if you can connect any time, any place to sensitive data assets that are outside of your office, uh, that also means that other people, if they exploit your login credentials, can do the same thing. Uh, what's to say somebody who uh, says they are Ben Schmerler can't connect to a DP Solutions assets in some other location. Uh, well, if I have a multi-factor authentication system where uh, I have something, a token like my cell phone or a actual physical token or a message to my e personal email or something like that that gives me a temporary code, it's much less likely that that uh, account access from a bad guy in another place that you know we may not know is actually not me uh, can connect in a secure way. We, we want to make sure that uh, we have uh, the, situ the solutions in place to know that the people logging in are who they say they are. And I would really recommend if you're not already using multi-factor authentication for important uh, logins to consider it because it's really one of the most foolproof ways, not 100% foolproof, but mo uh, very much a risk-reducing way to make sure that the people who log into the systems, no matter where they are, um, are appropriate. Uh, things like folder syncing have to be managed. Uh, when I do uh, data discovery scans, often as part of assessments, one of my uh, most common findings is that we have these weird folders where data is synced between a device and whatever the cloud asset is. So uh, let's say it's a Dropbox thing. This is very common where so for some reason that data that was supposed to be synced and go off to Dropbox and then just disappear from the uh, machine would never disappear. Maybe a temp folder wasn't deleted by the system by itself, or uh, some application problem occurred, or just, you know, over time, we just left a bunch of data on this machine. There has to be some management here and uh, follow through to ensure that we know where that data is and the thinking is, is managed accordingly. Um, this really runs into the policy implications. And when I say policy implications, I'm talking about the rules and standards we set for staff. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in having strong, coherent policies that make sense both to management and the end users. Uh, good policies uh, recognize the fact that we are trying to do work and be productive and get things done uh, and do it in a way that people can accept, but also uh, draw fair lines, you know, fair rules that talk about what people should be doing, when they should be doing it, and why they exist in the first place. If we're going to do a restriction or create some kind of rule or a way someone has to connect, it actually rationalizes uh, that approach so that people buy into it. And even if it's an inconvenient step, they understand why that step exists. So um, incident and disaster policies need to focus on endpoints and connectivity. So. Uh, in the older traditional environment, an uh, incident disaster policy might be that the server room's on fire, or there's a flood, or, or we've got hit with ransomware on our server or something like that. And that would be very common and certainly something to consider. Um, but what if the incident now occurs where uh, nobody can work and nobody can connect to our cloud host, perhaps because there's a problem with our cloud hosting provider. Maybe uh, they were hacked or maybe they had some kind of 
attack that brought their service down for a long time. Well, we need to come up with a policy and a plan to deal with those sorts of things. We need a policy to consider what happens if we're working in an office and all of our data is in these different places in the cloud and um, we can't access that stuff because the office loses power, loses internet connectivity. Does everyone work from home? Is that secure? Um, uh, should they go to a, a public Wi-Fi or somewhere else? I mean, what do we do for these sorts of things? So we really need to think about the endpoint devices, which are the PCs, servers, or I'm sorry, PCs, laptops, mobile devices, thin clients, et cetera, and what might exploit them and what might impact them. And then, of course, connectivity to those uh, to the things we care about. So um, it really is a matter of asking questions and thinking, how do we want to work in these scenarios? Uh, work flexibility is really great, but the rules need to be defined. So uh, I alluded to this earlier when I talked about inventory. So what devices can we use to connect and how do you deal with eavesdropping? So uh, to speak to the what devices can connect concern. Um, I, I'm a strong believer in making sure that every device that is used, whether it's personally owned or company owned, is at least accounted for in some kind of basic inventory. So we know what devices we're dealing with, what kind of mobile device management we need, what kind of rules we need to establish, if there's any concerns with those specific devices accessing this stuff. And of course, if somebody leaves, that we can disconnect those devices to our sensitive assets. Um, how do you deal with eavesdropping is another important one. So let's say we set up all this security. We have our encryption tools and our antivirus and our vulnerability tests and mobile device management, blah, 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 blah. And we've got all this tech set up and then people are doing sensitive work in a wide open space where anyone can read the screen. Well, who cares about all that security? We've created an environment where uh, people can eavesdrop and see that data without authorization and uh, it's because of personal carelessness, something that I can't really sell a technology solution for. Uh, I really uh, am a strong believer in things like security and security awareness training and phishing testing. Um, cyber crime and cyber incidents almost always are started with exploiting the weaknesses of a person. And as information moves to the cloud and the, the hosts uh, are, are more secured and have these really sophisticated monitoring solutions, et cetera, um, on their end, uh, we need to do things to strengthen up the end that we can control, which is the people, making sure that they're working in a responsible way, that they know what threats could be out there that impact them, what kind of data they're using, um, what a phishing attack might look like. And by the way, we're gonna test you for this every so often to try and get you you know, sort of battle tested to deal with uh, potential phishing and other sort of exercises. Um, so I really believe in that uh, in a, a major way. And I would say if you can avoid one incident by making your staff have improved awareness of security incidents, uh, these sorts of programs pay for themselves very quickly. Um, it doesn't take a lot, uh, you know, to spend a few thousand dollars a year on a real security awareness and phishing uh, program. Uh, and we avoid one incident that could bring you down for a day, well, that pays for itself right away in terms of lost productivity, stress, fines, et cetera. So uh, if you're not already doing that, um, definitely uh, get in touch with us. Uh, staff must be aware of the proper location, transmission, and other procedures of sensitive data. So they need to know what the sensitive data is, where they can access it, how they can access it, the way they transmit it to, to other uh, employees on staff, as well as maybe third parties. Uh, how to respond to strange queries, how to run th uh, the, the food chain as it pertains to permissions and stuff, things that aren't addressed in policy directly that will become concerns. Uh, really, there has to be an awareness of what you're doing and how you're doing it. And if we can't establish those rules, then we shouldn't allow um, that kind of work to, to occur, period. Uh, I'm uh, going to pivot again a little bit more to the tech side, and we're going to talk about encryption uh, because this is a really important concept to understand as we work in this anytime, anywhere, uh, any device environment. So a definition of encryption is a process where data is changed from a readable format to an unreadable format unless you have the key to change that format back. So if I wanted to send a message to Jill, and I wanted that message to be only between us, um, and I wanted it to be, uh, I wanted to send this over the internet or even between our two offices or something like that. I could put it in a language that only Jill and I could understand. And then I could openly send that message because it's a language that's gibberish to everybody else. That's essentially what encryption is. <coughs> Beg your pardon. This can be used both 
to your advantage and to your disadvantage. Uh, crypto locker and ransomware often exploit encryption to make the language unreadable to you. So they take your data, something that you have access to, and they put a twist on it, and now you can't read it unless you buy their key. Um, and if even if you buy it, sometimes they don't give it to you. But anyway, the point is, um, it's something that can be used to really make data private and unreadable. So at REST, we're talking about storage levels. So uh, flash drives, laptop hard drives, etc. If I have a laptop and that laptop has a lot of sensitive information, and let's say we are, we, you know, opening up the laptop and powering it on, we can't just get to that information without breaking credentials. Um, and that data on the storage device on the laptop itself is encrypted. Well, somebody can't just pop that drive out of the out of the laptop, plug it into a computer, and read the information because the information is encrypted. They don't have the key. They don't have the the book of translation, if you will, to read that data. If you're concerned about people leaving a cell phone on a taxi or uh, forgetting their laptop or having their laptop stolen or a server in a server closet being stolen from, you know, from the environment for some reason, I'd really recommend encryption at rest because it makes the data on that, those devices unreadable. This is a different kind of concern than, than what most people typically think of data, which is protecting it from loss. You know, I'm backing up this data or I have a disaster recovery solution because I want to protect that data from being lost uh, in my organization. Of course, that's important. We don't want to lose our data. But what we really don't want is for our uh, data to be read in transit where that data can be breached and then we have privacy issues and security issues. So encryption in transit is sort of a different way of looking at it. So before the data leaves my drive or my device, uh, that data is then coded into something else and then sent over. So my private letter is encrypted, right in a language, sent to Jill. She gets it, she decrypts it, and she reads it. If the, trans the encryption occurred not on the device itself, at rest on, the, on my computer, but in the message that was sent over to Jill. Um, we kind of need both of these things when we're working in uh, a mobile workforce. We need to make sure that the data we leave on devices that we control is encrypted, but that also the data that we send, whether it's to our third-party data centers or third parties, you know, that we just share information with, or between, uh, or, or between anybody, is is encrypted in transit. So why does this matter? I think I kind of alluded to this uh, a minute ago. So encryption can be used against you. This may be a familiar-looking uh, picture to some people. It's a little small, but you can see that. Uh, this is just a ransomware note. So your your data is encrypted, and you want to get it back. You got to pay for it. So this could be used against you, and it's one of the reasons we really uh, need to make sure our vulnerabilities are in check. That we're using proper security tools on endpoint devices, and that they're getting patched and updated. And we have proper, in some cases, network monitoring because uh, this could be. You you don't want to see this this sort of picture. Uh, again, we want to make sure the data when we transmit it over the public internet is secure. That that we're, we're getting in line with everybody else to send off our data, but we need to make sure our data is private, that no one can see, see what it is. Um, there really is very little security in general on public Wi-Fi networks. You know, when we connect to the Starbucks network or some guest network, we really don't know anything about that network. We might as well assume that that network's insecure. So if I'm going to be working in that kind of network where I don't know if someone's going to be spying on what I'm doing, uh, we need to make sure that anything that is transmitted is secure over that network. Otherwise, people could just be skimming information, you know, see, or reading whatever is, is happening. Uh, there's traveling storage devices that need to be secured too, whether that's a laptop, hard drive, or maybe you have a special piece of data that sits on a USB drive that you're taking from point A to point B. Well, you don't want to lose that data, drop it somewhere, have it stolen from you, and then someone exploit it for their own gain. And of course, the security of the data that remains on your PC when you sync files to the cloud. So um, if you're going to sync something up to a cloud host and that data is sensitive, uh, that goes between you and, say, Dropbox or OneDrive or, or, Google, or Google Drive or whatever, and you really care about that, well, we need to make sure that that syncing is done in a secure way, that every time that data is transmitted back and forth, that it is uh, not readable. Not only is all of this important, but there's a real fundamental question, which is what is your cloud services provider doing to protect the data? So you can't control what happens on that end, aside from the fact that whatever agreement or service 
that you've purchased from these, these providers should have some transparency in what they do. Well, we get these stock audits and we have these kinds of certifications and here's the redundancy we have and blah, 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 blah. We're, if we're gonna off source or outsource that uh, security function to those data centers, to those cloud hosts, to those SaaS providers, I, um, infra infrastructure as a service provider, so on and so forth, we need to make sure that the, we need to at least make sure that they're guaranteeing us that they're doing the right thing, so that we can say we've done our due diligence on this party we trusted, and we, they've given us all these assurances, certifications, etc. Not every cloud service provider is going to do things in a way that is compliant with certain regulations. So it's really important that before we start moving stuff around and working remotely, that we actually evaluate what we're doing and who we're doing it with. Mobile device management. So the cloud has given us flexibility in terms of what devices and whose devices we use to access the data, but what does MDM do? So it forces security such as passwords, encryption, app control, more. So these things that we talked about before that we really care about, we can force them by using a centralized managed mobile device management solution. So we don't just tell people that they need to have a password on their devices. The device is forced to have that, that rule. It can track devices accessing certain data assets. So um, we'll know which devices connect to, the, connect to that data, when they connected, how they connected, so on, what they downloaded, et cetera. You know, you can get those kinds of functions from an MDM. It can wipe data off those devices if necessary. So Jill's working for me and she's got a thousand social security numbers on her cell phone because that's what she's supposed to have. You know, it's her job or whatever. But then uh, she loses her phone uh, on an airplane or something like that. And uh, we want that data gone. So we can wipe that data using an MDM solution. Or let's say for the sake of argument, somebody quits one day and they get fed up and I'm leaving, I'm out of here. And they still have their phone with all of your data on it. Well, we need to wipe that, that data. Just that portion of the data uh, from the phone. And then there are other security features depending on the solution or the situation, maybe app updates, forced application install installations, um, forced uh, uh, operating system updates, things like that. Um, uh, this is the type of thing that can be tailored when the, when the solution is, is implemented and uh, we can talk with you more about that. Another solution, and this is a very broad solution, but it's something worth considering, especially if you need to meet sophisticated um, uh, compliance concerns such as um, VFARs or meeting the NIST standards um, or HIPAA or PCI or sometimes the SEC, et cetera, is things like network monitoring, endpoint detection, other higher end tools. So uh, sophisticated tools and, uh, and they, they run the gamut in terms of how they're implemented, what they can cost, et cetera, uh, and how they apply to you. Uh, they can record and log events that happen on devices for forensic purposes. So um, there are solutions that will take down a recording every time a file is opened or a click is made or someone logs in or something is saved or printed or shared or whatever. Basically, a full log, uh, almost like having a security camera on everything that's happening on that computer. Uh, why do we want this? Well. If someone abuses the rules or they, uh, there are uh, incidents that occurred, uh, having those events uh, in, in the back of our pocket, uh, pocket can help us determine later why an uh, incident happened uh, and uh, forensic companies can figure this stuff out based on logs. Uh, it can detect suspicious activity based on the correlation of events often. So, Let's say for the sake of argument that I am uh, a bad guy and I go into this system and a new user is created, and then that user's rights are elevated to administrator, and then that administrator goes into a file server and copies a bunch of data to something else, and then that data is, is transmitted somewhere, and then that account is deleted. Well, each of these events in, in and of themselves might not necessarily be an issue, right? You know, new users are created all the time, sometimes new system admins come in place, sometimes data is transmitted, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things by themselves aren't cause for alarm, but when you combine them all together in a specific period of time, sometimes you can correlate these things into uh, the consequences of a cyber attack. Uh, but you need to have some kind of network monitoring, what I call uh, some kind of security operations center, SOC, if you will, to get that kind of solution. Um, 
it, it can be expensive, but if you're in a compliance-based environment where you really care about these sorts of things and you want to stop incidents from becoming bigger than they have to be, this can be a very, very useful function. Um, additionally, oftentimes these solutions can disconnect trouble devices. Hey, we've noticed all the suspicious stuff happening on this one PC, so you know what? We're just going to cut it off. It's on its own island. So, oh, you're trying to send data from that computer? Well, guess what? That computer is no longer accessible to the network and the attack is over until we can make sure that everything is taken care of. So that can be really helpful. Uh, you can do things like forcibly block sensitive data from being stored or transmitted based on organization rules. One of the really nice uh, features of uh, some of the higher end Office 365 solutions, uh, this is a one very uh, simple example, is that you can set flagging rules that if somebody is going to send off a piece of data that is considered to be PHI, uh, personal health information, you can say, well, that we are forcing encryption on that piece of data, or we're not even allowing that piece of data to go out. We're going to block it because it was flagged by our system. Uh, these are called uh, data loss prevention solutions, and they're designed to uh, focus less on uh, things like actual security incidents and more about the behavior of, of people who are touching sensitive data and what they do with it, with the rules, with the rights they already have. So uh, these are sort of sophisticated things you can do. Uh, some, their applicability, whether they are uh, financially feasible or provide a return on investment, are a really different story, and they're not right for everyone. Uh, but if you are in a particularly sensitive field and you're concerned about really preventing security incidents and want to go to that next level, um, that's something we can have a talk about, and uh, these, these solutions are available to you. So in summary, um, when we're talking about all this stuff, we want to, uh, instead of thinking about a central series of assets like a fort, we have to look at security on a broader level. So instead of pre pre uh, pre uh, protecting the bank vault, we have to look at protecting a mesh, like a, a mesh of environments. Um, think of it like how the government might protect a series of airports, right? You know, the government can't focus, uh, in terms of airport security, they don't focus just on a BWI airport or or uh, or Kennedy Airport in New York or something. They look at all of the airports and how they all talk to one another. So we're we're talking about a a, a broad level as opposed to a centralized level like the Pentagon. I'm um, protecting that itself. Uh, the key to successful wireless and mobile impl uh, implementation and security is strong management with policies and tools to reinforce internal policy. So um, we want to have good security good tools, things that do the back-end stuff, like making sure devices are patched and get the security solutions, et cetera. But we also want to have actual behavioral policy that reinforce that stuff. I don't ever want to have to worry about uh, having a tool block ransomware on a device if the end user can implement and use the right kinds of behaviors to avoid t doing that in the first place. You know, uh, a car, if you drive on the road, you can probably drive through a pothole and keep going, right? Uh, the car will probably be okay, it'll be a bump in the road, whatever, but really the better idea is let's not hit that pothole, let's just swerve around it real quick and, and let somebody else hit it. Or really, We don't want anybody to hit it, but the point is, is that we want to avoid those pratfalls regardless of whether we have this, the tools in place to prevent the damage from it. Um, there is inherently a trade-off between device and work flexibility, and when you buy into security, you know, you have to buy into security rules and tools that remove some control from the end user. So, uh, if you really like your iPhone and it's your iPhone and you want to use it to work, uh, that means that you have pretty much waived the right to say, I don't want to have a password on this device. Well, the device may belong to you, the end user, but the data belongs to the organization. And if you want to use our data on your device, you have to let us uh, implement security on these devices. And if they're not willing to buy into that, then frankly, they shouldn't be allowed to use their, their device to access that data. Um, there has to be a trade-off. There has to be a compromise here. And if there isn't, then well, we really should just restrict the behavior to begin with. Uh, it's a very simple choice, and I know it's a little bit of a negative conversation, but it's one that has to happen. Um, any risk management plan, and I guess this is probably something that can be said about any of, of my webinars, a sophisticated risk management plan should evaluate all the potential ha uh, hazards for a wireless and mobile workforce and implement tools that have a good ROI on risk mitigation. 
Um, there is no 100% secure solution. Uh, everything is subject to risk. The things that we implement and the things that we do should provide risk mitigation in a strong level without having to break the bank. Um, network monitoring is very good, but they can only prevent certain things. Does that matter for the organization in question? I don't know. But what I can say, for example, is uh, security awareness is generally a low cost, but high ROI solution. By implementing uh, a security awareness uh, platform where people have to get trained and learn about potential issues like phishing, et cetera, if we can prevent one incident from occurring, well then that investment in the, in the solution really pays for itself quickly. And every organization should just say, here are all the risks that we could potentially face. What solutions can we use to address it? And what are we going to live with? Because uh, we can't prevent everything. And we have to actually show due diligence in our risk management plan uh, and, sh and make a justification for the things we picked and the things we didn't pick. And uh, now that we're done with the, uh, the plan content, we'll pivot a little bit to questions and, uh, and go from there. Great. Thanks, Ben. Okay, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them in the box and we'll answer them. Or you can uh, click the raise your hand button and I can unmute you to ask it yourself. Okay, so if anyone has any questions? Okay, we have one coming in, Ben. Um, let's see, are iPhones safer than Androids? Um, I don't think any device is more safer than the other uh, inherently. I think a few things to comment on. One is that any device, whether it's a phone or a tablet or a desktop PC or whatever, um, they all have unknown vulnerabilities on them. So even if you're doing good patch management, you've got antivirus in place, you're updating your devices, you're doing vulnerability tests, you're doing all the things I'm talking about, every device out there has a vulnerability that we don't know about yet. Just recently, uh, there was a big hullabaloo in the news about uh, the Intel i-series processors, which had some hardware flaw built into them, and they had to do a software patch that was imperfect. This, this flaw existed for years before they discovered it. So there is no secure device in, in that sense. Additionally, um, any you know, Google and Apple are generally pretty good about updating their devices for security, uh, but they're only as good as the work done to implement those updates, implement those patches, and, and secure them. And in my view, even if you could, you know, actually track all this stuff and say out of the known operate flaws that are exist, this one has more than the other, it really only takes one uh, flaw for something to be insecure. So I don't really think there is an inherently more secure device um, in and of itself um, that we can just say this is better than that. Um, it's really a matter of how they're managed and, and the security put around them. Okay, great. Okay, we have another question coming in. How do you encrypt a flash drive so that your work is secure? Um, there are a lot of ways. So um, I have a flash drive uh, personally that I got uh, uh, a while ago that had a software encryption tool built into it. So when I got the device, I could uh, encrypt it uh, when I first plugged into my computer and started using it. There are actual software tools that, in, that don't really care about what your flash drive is that will encrypt the drive. Uh, it doesn't matter what drive it is. You just go to Best Buy and pick up a 128-gig flash drive or whatever, and you plug it in and you, you encrypt it. You know, that's just a, another option. Um, I would advise you for specific solutions to contact us. If you have an account rep here, uh, you can reach out to them or you can reach out to me with your specific scenario. We can talk about what kind of data you're using on it and uh, what kind of encryption works for you. It's really a question of workflow. One of the things I always tell people, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about security or anything else, is um, what you need to do as an end user and a, or a manager is think about the ways you want to work. Try and think about the big picture here. I need to work in this way, in this place, and with these things. And don't think about uh, necessarily uh, encryption specifically. Think about the stuff you're doing, its importance, its sensitivity, the things that you have always known, and illustrate that stuff to technology people like me and the folks at DPS so that we can come up with a secure solution to do this. If you can focus on the, on the use case, then we can focus on the security behind it. So focus there, and then we can help you with the specifics. 
Okay, sounds good. Hope that answers your question. Um, how do I know if there's data stored on the devices that I care about? Um, there are tools to do this. Now, um, uh, I have a data discovery tool, and what it'll do um, on most devices is it will scan the device and it will look for the locations of uh, flags for personally identifiable information. So, um, you know, social security numbers, for example, have a pattern to them. You know, they're nine digit numbers with sometimes with, sometimes without dashes. And you can scan for flags on a device uh, for it to have that data. Uh, keep in mind, of course, that you can only search for data that has a specific pattern or a flag. Uh, what's not easy to scan for? Something like a name. So look at my weird last name, Schmirler, right? <laughs> uh, you might, if you're saying I want to do a scan for names on a hard drive, well, what's a name? A name doesn't necessarily even have a pattern. Certainly my name doesn't have a, an easily recognizable pattern. And so you can't really look for that, but what you can look for are things like dates of birth, social security numbers, credit card numbers, driver's license numbers, uh, account numbers, anything that has a specific pattern that we can scan against. Um, and what you're essentially looking for isn't necessarily the location of every piece of data, but that a device might have this data on it and what folders those devices may, you know, subfolders those devices may have them under. So that we can then get a, a, a picture of the landscape and then deal with uh, whatever we want to deal with after the fact. Uh, so there are tools to do it. And again, if you're looking for a specific, if you have a specific concern, that's when I would say contact us and we can come up with a, uh, a way to address it. Okay, great. Okay, we do have one more question. Um, let's see, what if my employees don't want mobile device management on their personal devices? Then they don't get to connect to your sensitive data. Uh, it's one or the other. So if, uh, it, or you can, I mean, alternatively, you can just say, yeah, okay, fine, we're going to do it. But then guess what? You're just taking on the risk. You're, you're saying that I'm going to run through this minefield, essentially. And you know what? That's a choice that people make, and, and you're entitled to make those choices. I'm not going to, to, to tell you what to do. Uh, but if, it's my, if it was my data and you were dealing with my sensitive information, and I found out that you were using these insecure personal devices to access this data, then I wouldn't feel very good about that. And so I don't think there is really a compromise here. If you have sensitive information, you don't want that data to be exposed, and, and if an employee wants to do it with their personal device, then they have to buy into security. And if they're not gonna do that, then they can't use that device. It's, it's really a simple uh, calculus. And I know that's an unpleasant message, and it's not necessarily, um, fair or, or fun, but it's something we have to live with. Um, uh, otherwise, it should all be company issued. And we could just say, well, this is your company's iPhone, and you have no choice in what you do on it because it only does work stuff, and you're, you're uh, forbidden from doing personal things on it because this doesn't belong to you. It's those types of choices that we have to make. Okay, great. I think that wraps it up for the questions. So. We can give you all a few minutes back in your day. Thank you again for joining us again. This will be available uh, on our website later this afternoon. Thanks, everybody. The contact information is right here for me. Uh, feel free to reach out. You can email, call, or whatever. Uh, or you can reach out to your account rep if you're already a client or, or anything like that. We're happy to follow up on this or other IT concerns you might have. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.